My name is Robert Proctor. I'm an attorney. I practice primarily in construction law and real estate. I do only enough now in copyright infringement because it's the new, I guess, the boutique litigation that we're seeing come through to a lot of people. Um, to give you an idea why this is a topic tonight, and to this afternoon, it's been a big topic with builders associations across the state of Wisconsin is the fact that what we're seeing is a spike in a number of lawsuits where design companies are claiming that builders who build certain types of home have violated their copyrights. Uh, most of this evidence is anecdotal. Uh, I think what really happened is what we've seen is a number of national design companies, people who design plans you know, for builders to use for a, maybe a three bedroom ranch or a, whatever type of house that you would want to build, have now come to Wisconsin. I've looked up a lot of the lawsuits and basically there's a couple of law firms, one out of Texas, one out of Tennessee, that seem to represent these large national uh, design companies. And they find a law firm in a state like Wisconsin and then you'll see the same two names on every single lawsuit that happens. Uh, so that's the reason that we're seeing here. We've seen a lot of builders become surprised where they get sued for the claim that, hey, your Plan A that you have on your website that you've used to build four houses violates my copyright and I'm suing you in federal court for damages. There's a large number of those lawsuits across the country. There are a growing number in Wisconsin. I know my law firm's defending one of them. I've seen at least two others and I've heard about a number of other ones that are happening. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it also. So that's kind of why we're dealing with the copyright um, seminar today. Just to be clear to help people with the language what a copyright is as opposed to some of the other terms you hear from you hear about a copyright applies to what's generally called an original work it's not you can't copyright an idea what you copyright is actually the design or the story or the expression of the idea. I just want to click quickly uh, tell you what a trademark is and a patent so you don't get those ideas com confused. A trademark tends to be a brand. Coca-Cola is a trademark. The Metropolitan Builders Association could be a trademark. Axley, our A right there, is a trademark. That's a brand that you identify with somebody. So a trademark is different than a copyright. A patent, which you hear a lot about, is basically the intellectual protect or is the protection for an invention, a process, a machine. So and then a copyright is the uh, protection of the expression of an idea, like the book you write, the song you write, the architectural plan you draw, the way you lay out a house. That is what a copyright is. So just to keep those three ideas separate so that they don't become confused. So Copyrights, this is just kind of the, the, the pure basic. Copyright protection is a federal statute. It's, um, it's quoted there for you. That's the number. You can look it up yourself. But basically, the United States, the federal government, passed a law saying we're going to protect the uh, design elements, the expressions that our citizens and inventors come up with, our artists come up with and they pass this law. That's where copyright protection comes from, from federal statute. And you can see right there the definition of it. Um, and what you look at is basically, it, this is a complicated way of saying that what they are protecting is when you come up with an idea and you put it into a tangible medium, whether that's a song, a book that you write, or a painting, or an architectural drawing, that they will protect that original authorship that you had. So that's basically what it is, protecting. And then you can see they list the categories, literary works so far till you get to the bottom, architectural works. That's the one that we're talking about. That's the protection that you will see building plans for residential homes are protected under the architectural works. Now, just so we're clear that in what it is, and in our, this is the definition under the statute, an architectural work, design of a building as embodied in the tangible medium of expression. It can either be the plan drawings themselves or the actual building itself. You know, so, for so for an example, a very unique building 
in and of itself will be copyrighted, not just that you took the plan. So it either is you took a plan from somebody and you copied it and used it for your own, or you copied identically the building as it exists. Both are, are protected by the copyright. There's one, a couple of ideas that need to be understood here. Copyright protection attaches to an original work covered by law, even if it's not registered. And what this means, and it's important, you don't have to do anything. If you draw an original building you know, plan that can be copyrighted because it's unique in some fashion, it's automatically copyrighted. You have copyright protection. You don't have to file it with the copyright office. You don't have to do anything. If somebody comes along and copies your plan, copies it in a substantially similar way that violates the law, you, have, you can sue the person actually for damages, but you can protect your copyright. So all of you who are home builders that do your own design on layouts and so forth, assuming that it can be protected by copyright, you don't have to do anything. It's already protected. And it's the same, the problem is if you kind of think this through, is it becomes difficult to know what has been copyrighted. Like how do you protect yourself from violating somebody else's copyright if you don't know, you know, if it's not, you can't go somewhere and check, is this a copyrighted plan? Another, only the author of a work can claim the copyright, that's kind of uh, common sense. Now the work made for hire doctrine, I wanted to touch on that too, as to the basics is that it basically means that the copyright belongs to the person who contracted to have it done. So if I am a building company, a home builder, and I own it myself and I design the um, layout, that's a copyrighted layout, it belongs to me. If I hire somebody, employ somebody to design, it, design a layout, that belongs to me, the employer. If I contract with a third party, an architect, to design it for me, it belongs to me, the person who contracted for it, unless there's something in the contract that retains the right to the architect, which you will usually see in the contract. The architects will try to keep it. Yep? I have a question. It, 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 does it work the same way that if someone comes to you, an owner, private owner that wants to, to have a house design, and they direct you, is that, is direct you into what they want? If you get the set of plans done for them, then did they own the, the, the intellectual material? Yeah, or generally the de excuse me. Generally, under the work for hire doctrine, they would own it unless you retain the rights to it. Most contracts that you'll see from a builder will say we retain the right to all of the plan specifications. So actually, it's going to be the owner of the home that actually owns the copyright for their idea, then, right? For what they told you to draw. Yes, yeah, generally because they hired you to draw it for them. So that's, I mean, and that's the idea of the work for hire. It kind of makes sense. If I hire you to draw my plan, it becomes mine. Yep. Basically, they're hiring you for a one-time use of the plan. Well, that's what your contract would say. Generally, that's what most license would say. Yeah, the default could be, I mean, you, we can get into what the understanding of the parties was, and you get to some of the problems of not having a contract that deals with it. You'll say that it was a one-time use that you contracted for because we talked about it and I said hey I'll use one of my plans and I'll modify it and it'll be a one-time use for you and you remember that and I remember saying I wanted you to design this unique house for me and now you just built four more of them in the subdivision you know in the same subdivision one on each street corner so I get to go buy my house each time and the question becomes well who it becomes a matter of proof Actual, there's, there's two ways you can, well actually three ways you can actually copyright. One is um, design concept, two mm -hmm. would be technical drawings, and three would be actual building. It's my understanding that if a owner comes to you with a little Google or something like that, they can copyright that. But if they hire an architect to actually do the drawings, the architect actually owns the drawings. Otherwise there's a whole liability issue and everything else about, okay, now you drew the plans, it's wrong, I'm going to sue you. Well, why would you sue me if I really don't own the plans? Yeah, but you're talking about two different things. The plans mm -hmm. in and of themselves, the functionality of the plans, and we'll get into that, are never copyrighted. Like the idea of the plan, you don't copyright that this is the way you put a flashing on. You don't copyright this is the way the door is installed or this is what's to code. You copy the design elements. 
as a whole. So for example, you lay out the house and you say the bedrooms are in the, in the front, the dining room's in the back, the sinks are here, the facade looks like this, the, you know, the design elements, that's the only elements that are being copyrighted, nothing functional about the house at all. And so the, the and when you talk about, for example, you can copyright, you can't copyright a window. It's a functional element of the house. You can copyright the design of the window. So you create a unique design, a star-shaped design with three circles around it that's red, blue, and green. You can copyright those elements together. But the window itself, uh, the fact that you have a window on a house, you can't copyright. And so what I mean by when you talk about liability as to the plans, you're conflating two issues. One issue is, did the architect live up to his design standards of designing plans that, for example, you know, the roof doesn't leak because, it, you know, the, because he designed the correct shingles to be used on the roof, that the electrical is up to code, that the HVAC is up to code on all of his things. None of that's copyrighted. Those are just functional items. It's just the layout. So to say that there's a liability by who owns the plan is different than saying, because there is, as to the ownership of the plans, we're saying it's the ownership as to the copyright. And you get into the, an interesting issue about when you don't have a, a very, if you don't have a contract that says who it is and you start getting into the default rules, there's nothing, you could say as a default, a work for hire, I say work for hire exists. That, I mean, I'm overstating it in the sense that people are going to say there was an understanding between us. And if you don't have it in writing, there's going to be a misunderstanding between people. And to say that the law is so extremely clear, it's not. Nothing it requires that you have in writing what is, who owns the copyright of the plans. And so if it's not in writing, it's going to start falling back onto these doctrines like, is it work for hire? Was there an understanding? Did the builder, for example, a perfect example would be you use the same plans over and over again off of your website, and you show them, and they see them on their website. I would say, how could you ever think that I was selling you a copyright to a plan that is, you know, my base house that I build everywhere. You know, it wouldn't make sense. Anyway, so did, did that kind of address it? I mean... Not really. I mean I'm still thinking if, if somebody comes in and, 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 and hires a person to create something, they're, they're hiring you to provide a service. That person is creating the intellectual thought of creating the actual mm -hmm. design concept and the drawings. And I, create, and I think of those as two different things design concept, which is copyrightable, and the technical drawings, which is a whole other thing that's copyrightable. So why would I sell an intellectual concept to somebody that I can never use again? Well, I would ask you, why would you? That's a business question. The question is, is what does your contract allow and what does the law allow? And if you're going to leave it silent and it's important to you, I would be careful because, first of all, the plans, the technical plans can be copyrighted only as to elements, design elements. You know, you can't copyright the fact that it has bathrooms. You can copyright how the bathrooms, bedrooms, and kitchens are organized. And then the building itself could be copyrighted, you know, as a, as a, but all of them can be copyrighted. But then arguing over who gets the copyright, and I'll explain it. I hire you to write me, uh, to write me a story for my website. Why would I hire you to write me a story that you could keep and give to every other law firm in the state and put on their website? Why would I hire you to, to design a website for me that everybody else in the state could copy if it was a very good website? Why would I want that? That's, so that's why I would hire you to make me an original designed website and not give it to everybody else. And so, I mean... Well, yeah, but I mean, you don't need to put the C under there. I mean, that does a copyright attaches right away as long as it is a, an original work that can be copyrighted. If it's on one of those categories we talked about, there's automatically a copyright. You don't need to say it's copyrighted or it can't be copyrighted. It either can or it can't be copyrighted. And so, I mean, in the work for hire doctrine, I think makes sense. I mean, if I hired a, I mean, and, and I'd also just step back and say, like, you know, this is kind of an intellectual exercise is that most contracts will provide who owns it. I mean, that's a huge, you don't want that to be an issue. I mean, if I'm a builder that's using a set of plans over and over and over again, I want to know they're my plans. I don't want anybody to think that if they see that same house or a substantially similar house in the subdivision one over, that they can sue me. I want that crystal clear in my contract. 
And I, I mean, even, and I believe the Metropolitan Builders Association has a specific section on like if the owner brings it, the owner then agrees to indemnify them if they don't own the copyright. So I just mean that I wouldn't leave it to how the law figures something out when there's a dispute based on, we call them default. If it's not explicitly, explicitly set forth in the contract, you then defer to the default rules, which is, you know, what did the parties intend? Work for hire. I wouldn't say it's so clear that if I design something in a contract, for, I mean, if I, somebody hired me to design something for them and I wanted to keep the design, I would make that crystal clear that I was licensing them a one-time use of it. I mean, otherwise I run into the problem where Otherwise, you're hired to, hired to design something that is unique for one person, and then they turn around and give it to somebody else, and they build it 50 times. They're reusing the same set of plans that somebody else created. There again, there's that full liability yeah. thing. Well, yeah, but I mean, so you're saying you put it in contract form in right? your yeah. contract, even under work made for hire. If it's in your contract, yeah. they can't use it for anything, even though it's, it's it was done so for them. One time use. <coughs> But to say it's typical isn't to say that that's, that's the one-time use comes from licensing agreements. The licensing agreements will say, I design a bunch of plans. So if you go to a designer site that builds, that provides designs for residential contracts, you'll look at the license and say, you know, you can look at the, well, in this time, the, you, you look at the contract and say it's licensed for the use of one house for $1,000. It's the one-time, that's where that language comes from. There's no law, for example, if you read this entire, this entire statute that we just had on, on copyright, nowhere in the statute will it say that it's presumed that it's a one-time use if it's built, designed for somebody. I mean, that doesn't exist. So all I'm saying is that I'm not going to disagree with you that depending, I can push, push the facts around and say in this case, it's clear that the intention of the parties was a one-time use. And I could push them around and say in this case with a home, it's not clear that it was intended to be a one-time use, that, that, it was, that it could be. And so my point is, is that I would just, I would put it clearly in the contract so you don't have to have that discussion with somebody. Because, you know, what is, how would you say it, the common perception of what the law is isn't always what the law is. And it may, get you, it may keep you safe 80% of the time. But if, it, if you know, it's on the ones that are the exceptions to the common perception rule that will get you in trouble. So, I mean, that's, and so we'll just move on to that point before it gets too beaten. Um, all right, copyright registration. This is how you, cop you do a registration. It's a little bit outside of the scope, but I wanted to say it to people who care about getting your own plans registered, is that although copyright protection attaches right away to your work, if, so long as it's protected by the statute, the way you can perfect your rights or increase your rights is by filing a claim with the uh, copyright, U.S. Copyright Office. Um, and basically what that claim does is you file, you complete an application, you pay the filing fee, and then you usually dis deposit a copy of your work. So you would take your uh, copyrighted work and put it, and file it and put it in, and send it to them and they keep it online. And then they will usually send you a letter back either saying it's been accepted or it's rejected and here's why it's rejected. And the reason that it's in, important if you want to copyright your own plans is because the registration provides certain benefits which I've listed there. Most importantly, it allow, you can't sue in federal court unless you have registered it. So or, uh, filed it, registered it with the copyright office. So if you come to me and say somebody stole your or violated your copyright protection, we would have to go and file your copyright claim before we could actually file the lawsuit. It doesn't mean you weren't protected. You still have the protection. It's not like, oh, somebody can steal it up until the time you file the registration. You would just have to do it prior to the lawsuit. And then it provides for additional damages when determining. Yep. On, on when you can do that? Say you didn't really discover until 10 years later that someone's been using your plans for something. There is a, there's certainly going to be a statute of limitations for bringing a copyright claim. I don't know it off the top of my head. I would doubt it's 10 years long. It, like a copyright, the duration of a copyright is usually the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. Most statute of limitations you'll see top out at around six years. So, I mean, I would say obviously you don't want to sit on the claim. Some are based on the date of discovery though. So like in the example you're saying, you didn't discover it 
until such and such a time. They usually run from the date you discover it. So, but if you sat on it, that could be a problem. Um, and it's a good question. I'm sorry I didn't know the, the statute of limitations on these claims, though. But you could easily look it up uh, through Google. But anyway, and it's important that there, there is a good reason to file the claim, though, right away, too, is that the statutory fees and attorney damages are based on a timing issue, is that you have to file it a certain amount of time from the day you created it in order to get under the, not to get your protections generally under the statute, but to get the additional uh, statutory damages and attorney fees protection. So if your idea is that you really want to create protected works that you intend to protect in the future, you will want to file the claim. It's not too expensive. It's not too difficult. You can do it online. Um, it, you could hire an attorney to do it if it's certainly if you have any questions or if it's substantial, but there's ways to do it. Um, but my point about that you don't have to do it if it's you're not really worried about copyright violation of your own work, it's just that something came up, you know, you still are protected even though you didn't do anything, so long as it's your original work. All right, we're going to just get quickly into some of the um, issues. When we start thinking through what can be protected, it becomes a little bit more difficult when we're talking about residential construction because the similarity that exists already between all houses. And so the, when we talk about it, the only thing that can be copyrighted are what's called original elements, um, which protects things which could, by no stretch of the imagination, be called, um, be called by the author, could be created by the author. And, and we start talking about this coming from these, these, this case, uh, home design. But when we talk about home plans, this is what I kind of talked about a little bit before, is that you can't copyright the functionality of a house. So you can't say, I'm copywriting the fact that a house has a bathroom, bedrooms, and kitchen. You know, you can't copyright that. What you can copyright are how the bathroom, kitchen, the appliances, certainly the fixture appliances, such as the refrigerator, the sinks, the um, facade, the type of roof, the, the, design, the roof, all together fit. So we're generally not saying that, you know, well, I suppose you could copyright an individual bedroom if there was something extremely unique about it. But generally, it's how they fit all together. Um, and that's what people have copyrighted. And those are the lawsuits that we are seeing. Um, so it's, I talked about it before, a window in and of itself as a, the fact that it's a window can't be co uh, copyrighted, but the design of it can be. Um, the, what we're looking at in these lawsuits is generally what the court is looking at is a test to determine whether or not somebody violated a copyright. And in this, ca in this case that explains it, you'll see that one, the court looks to see if there was access. Did the person have access? And in the building industry, what we generally see the access come from is people visit design build website or the design website where you can go and look at plans on site and they will keep a list of all the people and their domain names that came to that site and looked at it. The other way they find them is they, a number of lumber yards have been sued. Lots of people get plans from lumber yards. The lumber yard gets sued because the lumber yard actually got a book of plans that were copyrighted by somebody else. And then they, they ask, OK, give us all the names of the people you gave the book of plans to. And then they look to see, did those people build any houses? And even though you got them from the lumber yard, they will come to you and say, you built a house violating my copyright, and you had access to the plan. The third way we see it is just in a way we see in a lot of modes is that they just have people go out that um, go on the websites of builders to start putting in Home Builder Wisconsin and going to every website, looking at the plans that are on the website and comparing them to the plans that they've already copyrighted to see if some of the plans are similar. And that's how they determine, you know, that's how they've been finding people. So, and in generally, um, and if they can't show that they had access, they're going to try to show that it was strikingly similar. That's kind of like, so they could say, well, we can't prove that you actually saw our plan, but the plans are so strikingly similar that the court's going to, we're going to ask the court to say that it, we've met this element. Now, this is where the real test comes from, 
is that they're going to have to show, um, and if you ever just Google this case, it's kind of interesting. You can find it online if you care about this and want to read the facts. It was where a design service company that designs home plans sued a home builder. And the home builder wins in this case. But to show that the plans are substantially similar, you have to, you look at, you take the plan and say, would it be recognized by the average lay observer? And the reason that that's kind of important, saying that we look at the average lay observer, is I would say to you, well, what does that mean? You take the average person and you look at two layouts of homes and you say, this layout looks like that layout. Tell me too many, how many three bedroom ranches don't look alike? You know, how many, you know, they all have a kitchen, they all have three bedrooms, they all have, you know, a bathroom or two. It's not, so the question beca becomes, it becomes a very strange standard. And what I don't like about it as a lawyer is I tell you, if you get in, if you become, a, if you're accused of taking somebody else's plans and building a home, and you ask me, well, look at them. Are they substantially similar? Well, I don't know. We could impanel 10 juries and you'll win seven times and lose three times. And what that means is it's difficult for me as an attorney to create a safe harbor box to say, if you do this, you won't, nobody will allege that you stole their copyright. And if you do this and we go to court, we will win. I, I can't do that because we have this standard that says we're going to take the average observer and try to determine how they see the two plans together. Now, you could sue almost anybody for anything. If you, the last 15 years, you go through subdivisions around here, and almost I mean, every house is the same, because people want the same thing. They want that, they want all these gables and valleys, and, and you go through them, that thousand look like the same builder could have built all of them, but it could have been 12 different builders. Uh, it's, I, what, it's what your customers want. So, so, I mean, by that standard, anybody want to sue you, you could just go through any subdivision and start suing people because, geez, I had a house like this once that I designed. It was a, you know, a three-bedroom ranch with gable valley hip, you know. I, I, I. Square feet, 2,000 square feet. I mean, the way, the way that this is, is anybody can sue anybody for anything. Well, I just start, I've been, I've been crazy. I've been drawing plans for 35 years. I just start going on. Maybe I'd be make more money by suing people than actually drawing them. Well, are, are, some of us would argue, some of us would argue, I'll say this as diplomatically as I can, that that's not, although you're being facetious, that's not too far past what the design companies have done. I would guess that if we saw their agreements with the plaintiff's attorneys that they've hired, they're contingency-based, much like a collection agency. They say, here we have a website with all of our designs on it, we file a copyright even though there's nothing particularly original about our layout. We then try to sell them over the internet and we make a good business doing that. And then on this side we have an attorney who we don't pay anything unless he gets money. And he goes around on the internet finding people who have plans that are similar. He then hires local attorney in the state to file the lawsuit with him. Your insurance picks it up. These cases are very expensive to litigate. Because all houses look so far, so much alike, they're difficult to defend in the sense that I say, do I think you stole, do I think you violated copyright law? Absolutely not. Do I know what 12 jurors are going to do when they look at the plans? It becomes almost a, who's the better speaker to the jury? Who does the jury believe more? If you happen to be correct, but a cankerous old man and the jury doesn't like you, you may lose even though you're correct, you know, and vice versa. And so my point, and then most of these settle for some amount of money. So do I believe, in my own opinion, being only my own opinion, not my law firm's opinion, not the opinion of the Metropolitan Builders Association, that this is a bit of a, this is not the type of law that I'm proud to see as an attorney in my profession? No, I do think that people are chasing claims that are dubious at best. I will say there are some claims that I saw where people will buy the book that, and the book will say for $1,000 you, know, $1, you can buy a one-time license, like we talked about one-time use, and then they'll use every single plan in the book over and over again, and you can then show easily that they actually did what they're accused of. 
And I'm less sympathetic to those cases, but I know I've talked to builders who are extremely frustrated, one in particular I know of, who says, how can I prove, you know, I hired an architect for these, I, you know, I, uh, how could I ever prove that I was the original author of these? Of course they look the same, They're, you, you know, to some degree. But getting to that point, and because a couple points I want to make before we get too late, and I know you guys are all going to want to get out of here on time, is substantially similar. The, I think this is a good quote from the court in the home design, is they say, we're mindful that there's only a finite number of ways a rectangle can be divided into bedrooms, baths, kitchens, living rooms, and so forth. And so when you look at architectural plans of this type, which are very common run-of-the-mill residential homes, you, the modest dissimil dissimilarities um, are more significant. And, and what they mean by that is if you design the Eiffel Tower and somebody builds a smaller version of it, of your copyrighted tower, it's, you could say even though it's a different square footage, footage, it's a different height, it's a little bit different, there's, it's such a unique design that you, you can look at it and say clearly that's a violation of my copyright. But in a home what they're saying is that Square footage may not, like a few thousand square feet or, or the location of the door may not sound like a, like a very big, a very significant design element. But when the, when the homes are so, designs are so generic to some point, they're big, those are the issues. And it came up in this case, you can see that in this case, which is interesting is what happened is that at first glance the court said, that the floor plans and overall general layout were substantially the same. The layout was the same. It was four bedrooms and two bathrooms. And if you took one plan and laid it on the other, you know, the lines all kind of lined up to some degree where they looked very similar. And then the court took it to the next level and said, but however, the similarities between the layout made it so no reasonable jury could find the design substantially similar. And what it looked at, you can see the list there, and I'll just say them real quick, different square footage, an island in the kitchen, the location of the stove, the number of walk-in closets, the location of sinks uh, in the master bedroom, the size bathroom, the size of the doorways, the closet, the number of windows, the presence of a chimney, all the little design elements that could change. You know, and you look at it and you'd say, you know, these houses could look a lot alike. And in this case, they found this, these are the reasons why there was no copyright violation, which makes perfect sense. But that's the point. I think it's an instructive case. So, quickly, just to, before we run out of time, we're going to talk about a couple of more points. One is uh, the liabilities that, that builders face. One is actual damages um, and profits. Um, and then, like we talked about, so basically they can go and disgorge you of your profits. So if they allege that you did this 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, they can try to go after all of, they can, well, they're going to take their actual damages and profits, so they would say that what my profit on selling you these 14 homes would have been. You know, how much have I lost as the designer? There's statutory damages, as you can see, are anywhere from $200 in infringement up to $150,000 for willful. So if they find that you actually downloaded the plans without paying for them and copied them. The last one is the one I really want to kind of look at it. As in most of these cases, the attorney fees in this type of case are usually, and the expert fees, extravagant. Um, and I have not defended one, but I know generally when we get into federal court, all of these cases have to be brought in federal court. Whenever my law firm litigates in lit federal court, if this was, is a all-out litigation over whether a builder, let's say, used, built 25 homes using copyrighted plans, you're talking 75, 150,000 to get you through summary judgment, all the way through a trial, maybe $200,000 in attorney fees. And you may owe the other side all of their attorney fees. And like we always say, when the other side gets attorney fees from you, they're, not u they're using what we call a heavy pen when they write down their numbers. You know, you're not going to be getting the quick, down and dirty, easy law for numbers. You're going to get a bigger attorney fee bill from the other side. So that's a big issue when you talk about it. And when you can think about some of these bigger cases, it's the bigger builders. So I have a website, and I have three specific designs that are mine. You know, the, and I call them you know, design A, design B, design C. And I build 20 homes a year. And they say, your design B and C violate my copyright. 
and then you know and you built 15 a year for the last four or five years you start getting into a bigger into a bigger ballpark of uh, claims um, some of the issues of what builders can do to protect themselves from such claims Th this is obvious it's common sense you got to know where it's coming from the plan uh, the problem with it is is just simply getting a plan from a third party doesn't limit your liability in essence you know so you have to be able to rely on that third party that you know that you're getting an original piece of work that they have the ability to let you use it's no different if you think about it if I check out a book from the library and I give it to you and I say hey it's an original it's you know you can do whatever you want with it and then you're going to photocopy it and sell it as your own you know that author is going to come after you you know it's, you can't just assume that because an owner or a lumber yard gives you plans that you can use them and that they're not copyrighted and it's with the lumber yards that I um, that I would only point out to you is that you know one way that we that we've been told I should stress this is anecdotal that they find out about builders who have violated uh, the copyright is by going to the lumber yards and saying who did you give these plans to do you and a lot of lumber yards didn't tell people hey these are copyrighted plans they've just kind of hey here's a set of plans that you can start with do you know and it turns out that those plans are identical in some lawsuits that we've heard that we've researched that those plans are identical to the copyrighted plans you know those copyrighted plans found their way to the lumber yard you know and that person yep again we go back to if the owner was the one that was actually going to own the copyright if there was nothing, nothing that that was strictly mm -hmm. done and or documented that that they did not own it would you assume as to what we were talking about before that that owner would be the one that owned the intellectual property there are because that other gentleman there said that if we do a house for somebody one time now they own the copyright to it yeah, but you are no, you going can't to build that house again. Well, then how can you turn around? And well, they're going. The we sue it. They're going to sue everybody who allegedly violates the copyright, and, and that's the point. The, and I, and my analogy might not have been good about the book. If an owner gave you a song, gave you the song "Stairway to Heaven" written out, and then you recorded it and started selling it, do you think your defense? I mean, I know this is, and and I understand I'm using a ridiculous. Um, example do you think that your defense is going to be able to be the owner gave it to me it, it doesn't matter that it's it, it doesn't matter they're going to say you made the money off of the song that was somebody else's song and I'm going to sue you for the profit I should have made off the sale of the song now if it, now that's where we get into the willful remember in order to get statutory um, and a fees, so the statutory damages and attorney fees, they have to show willful. So in that case, there's no willful violation. Somebody gave it to you, and you thought that they had the right to use it. So you're not going to get penalized in the sense that you're going to have to pay the other side's attorney fees and deal with all the um, statutory f damages from willfully stealing the idea in a, or stealing the plans, in essence but they're still going to get the profit from you. You know, they're going to say you, that this profit was lost by the person with the copyright because you used it without paying them. And we're going to take that money from you and give it to them. And they're going to sue all. And then you would have a claim against the owner who gave you the plans and claiming that you had to pay all of this money because the owner violated the copyright to you. So that, that's where one... You all right? Oh. Yep. Okay, I'm going to skip the... Yeah, okay. I'm going to keep going on. And quickly, one point. We have a few more minutes left I want to make clear because this is an extremely important point is that most copyright claims are going to be covered by your insurance under the general commercial general liability policy but don't just rely on me telling you what the normal policy says if you use designs you should check with your agent get an email back in writing so you can stick it in your file just in case they deny it and you will know that where they are generally covered is under 
what's called the advertising injury, injury section of the policy. And generally what it is is they're, cop they're typically covering some type of copyright infringement based on your advertising of the plans and so forth. And when they use the term plans or advertising, it's very broad. Advertising could be you built a house using copyrighted plans and stuck your sign in front of it saying built by ABC Home Builder. You've now advertised copyright and it's, it's covered by your insurance policy. If you have the usual commercial general liability policy we've seen. And so my point is, is that if you want to be safe, you pop an email to your insurance agent and say, listen, I saw a seminar on copyright law. I want to make sure that if, I, if, I, if I'm accused of violating copyright law, that it's covered by my policy. And there's two sections to look at. One is the advertising claims. That's where usually you'll see copyright, and it will usually specifically say copyright is covered. And two, then you want to look at the specific exclusions to see are there any types of damages or claims that are excluded. That's how you read all insurance policies. But I would definitely not rely on your own reading of your policy. I would talk to your insurance agent. Um, and the other point, and this is always true in any time you have an insurance claim, if, if you get sued for copyright violation and you submit it to your insurance company and they cover it, they're going to send you what's called a reservation of rights letter because there's going to be circumstances in the claim where it may not be covered. And so what they're saying is, hey, we're covering you, but we reserve the right not to cover you depending on what happens. You're not going to want to deal with the attorney given to you by the insurance company. And I can explain why, what that is, but you're always going to want to take that reservation of rights letter to your own attorney because that's what's called a coverage issue. So if you ever get a, a letter that says we're reserving our rights from an insurance company, you don't give it to the attorney that, or you can, give it to the attorney that the insurance company appointed to defend you, you go to your own attorney because that's the attorney that will tell you what coverage you have. Um, well, and then it, obviously if you receive a cease and desist letter or you get sued, the first thing you're going to want to do is talk to your attorney right away. Don't sit on it. Don't not pay attention to it. Don't say this is a bunch of BS. I drew the plans myself. I've drawn my own plans for 35 years. You don't want to get into the, you, you want to see if you can nip it in the bud as fast as you can, and you want to make sure you have coverage under your policy. So that's why you want to make sure you act affirmatively. Don't sit on your rights because you want to make sure you don't do anything that prevents your coverage. Do you have a question? Yes, you're going to Okay. Yep. Just uh, with this, how many suits do you see in Wisconsin a year or in the last 10 years on this type of thing? To be honest, it wasn't even on my radar last year. This year, we started at, I do a lot with the Madison area builders, uh, some with the Metro. We started getting questions about it because a few people got sued. So I went, we have a database for Attorneys West Law, you may have heard of it, um, where we can pull up all the lawsuits. And we, last, it, this is very unscientific, but we saw, uh, certainly, we saw about, I think, in the first quarter of the year, nationally, about 23 lawsuits, and I think five or six in Wisconsin. And I think what really we're seeing here in Wisconsin, I don't believe, and it's the, the company Home Design Selector, I forgot the, the lawsuit I put up earlier with the name on it, you'll see them in a lot of them, probably the, one of the more, I saw them in a number of lawsuits. Uh, I think what we're seeing is that these lawsuits have come to Wisconsin more than that they've come nationally. Because when I look up lawsuits that involve home builders, I can, they'll go back to 19, or to 2000, you know, 2001, 2002. They're not a brand new thing, but when in the state of Wisconsin, it's just been in the last year or so that we've seen a number of them. So I think that, like anything, remember mold claims? Used to never see a mold claim, and all of a sudden we, we couldn't avoid mold claims, and now I don't see that many mold claims anymore. So it, it, it's kind of the, 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 juror, the juror lawsuit. So we're actually after 5 o'clock, so I know it's been a long day, so please... Uh, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, I appreciate the, the dialogue makes it much easier for me. So I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank